is uh, a great pleasure to uh, have with us today Anna Helen Earth, if I said right, yes, sir, yes. Yes. who uh, is uh, the recent uh, city planning director for the city of Miami, where she accomplished many things, including the Miami 21 rezoning, something about which we uh, have been interested and commented on and impressed by, and which survives. I think you'll tell us more yes. about that. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you know, I think something I didn't know, that uh, she was uh, uh, named the top public official of the year by Governing Magazine, which I think is a terrific honor. Uh, she is uh, now a low fellow at Harvard University, and she's going to speak to us about Miami. So, Anna, please. Thank you. I have um, had the pleasure of being part of something that happened in Miami, which was big. Um, in Miami, I remember five years ago when I sat with the uh, then mayor Manny Diaz in his office and we were talking about planning and we were talking about everything that it wasn't really working in our city. Um, and it was one of those moments where we both talked and over a slide projector kind of going the good and the bad and what he said that we need to do. And we talked about walkability, we talked about open space, we talked about transit, we talked about how do we make a better city for everyone. Not just for the few, um, but for everyone that would be detached from politics or uh, that it could be a code that everyone and it could survive the time. At that moment, looking back at it, I think without realizing it, that was a defining moment. That was a moment that we were making history, a moment where we were part of something bigger, that it was how are we going to take the challenge and making Miami overhaul a whole zoning code that we had in a moment, as you see in, in a few slides, where Miami was seeing an unprecedented growth. It was that leadership which when the stars align and we have them all together where we say you have the desire to make something good and you have the opportunity of doing so when you take it and for that I am grateful as a planner that I was able to fulfill that dream Miami and we've had had a Euclidean code for such a long time I think our first code was in the 20s and after that, we had just fixed it and fixed it and fixed it. And it really never, nothing ever was fully done. It was just a patchwork that we were um, fixing a problem here, fixing a problem there. When we were, everything had a name because everyone had come and everyone wanted to fix their neighborhood. But it was never a wholesome, comprehensive uh, review of what is it that we were doing. So this is why it was so critical that we were doing this for Miami, that we were saying instead of having particular neighborhoods come over and ask us to fix it for them because they didn't want it to have it. It was an opportunity of being able to say, uh, let's do it for everyone, even for those who are not asking. So this is Miami skyline. In 10 years, the from 2004 to 2010, this is the growth we have seen. And this is important because it's in the midst of us doing the, ho the uh, overhaul of the code. We saw 75,000 residential units, 6,000 hotel rooms, 8 million square feet of office space, 7 million square feet of retail, and over 300 large-scale projects. We had four master plans going. We had the Parks Master Plan, and we had Virginia Key Master Plan, we had a Coconut Grove Master Plan, and uh, we had Miami 21. So we had a heavy, great eight years of planning for the city. So what is Miami 21? Miami 21, it stands for the 21st century. It's an overhaul of the zoning regulations, the former overhaul of the, what we had on the zoning. We want to encourage pedestrian and transit friendly development. We want to use a form based code. One that would emphasize the form as I was explaining before, not a Euclidean code. And we wanted a code that applies smart growth principles that would concentrate on a greater mix of housing, commercial, and retail. Why Miami 21? The former zoning regulations, as I was explaining, was a patchwork. It was a 
problems been trying to fix but never looked in the in, uh, overall comprehensively. It was always just for particular neighborhoods. Um, we wanted clear and specific guidelines. We always find that developers come to us and say, you know, we don't really have an issue with you asking us, you meaning the government asking us to do some things. We just need to be clear as to what it is that you're asking. Uh, an efficient permitting process, just to see what the permitting process in Miami was. It was, it was a joke. It looked like, uh, you know, there were so many arrows that you really need a roadmap to know <laughs> what, what is it that you needed to do. And it would take forever, which obviously represented money. Um, and it wasn't, and we wanted a stable environment, something where people felt that they could invest, that government was friendly, and that uh, we were promoting Miami. The principles, smart growth, new urbanism, I think, um, and I always say this, um, I won't read them all, but I'm sure just looking at them that you will, everyone around this room will agree that this is everything everyone wants for a community, the sense of place mixed-use community, to be able to provide a range of housing opportunities, to create a walkable neighborhood, to preserve the open space, historical resources, um, and make development decisions more predictable. What we had before was, like I was mentioning to you, the Euclidean zoning that was, was, has given us its sprawl, separation of uses, not walkability, um, and auto uh, an auto-dependent community. We are trying to get out of that in Miami. And excess of parking. It clearly, you would walk downtown, you would walk any neighborhood, and there was not that environment that everyone longs or everyone when they come to Boston or they come to San Francisco or they go to New York, they like it. We wanted the same things. And this zoning code we had was not giving us that. This is an example on this photograph that I show is to show you what, was pr what the problem was. This is in a commercial corridor, right behind it, you have a single family home. That exists today with the Euclidean code we had. It allowed for that type of thing to happen. The city planning department does not review every single project and that, that's why to do a code that was comprehensive for the whole city was important. Miami, we only review maybe 25% where we actually can have those beautiful buildings that people see where we actually sit down on a table and negotiate with the developer as to what we want. But the code itself that we, we had, the former code, pretty much it was a free for all and it was a one size fits all. And it really, at the end of the day, we could sit with the people, we could talk to them about it, but the law was behind them. They had the right to be able to do what they had, you know, what the book allowed. So uh, it was us in negotiation that gave us better buildings, but this one that I'm pointing out it was by right, as we say, it doesn't go through any particular review, and this is what happens. All the problems we were having. Um, in this area, this is Coconut Grove, for those who are familiar with Miami, but to give you some sense, it's kind of like the size of Car Harvard Square and some environs, that, that, that area. Um, it's not big. It had 22 zoning designations, and those are it had, in addition to the base map, that is the land use, then you had special district overlays, which is the ones I was referring. Every single person that wanted to change something in their particular neighborhood would come to the city council and say, could you do some guidelines for us? Could you do this? Could you do that? In addition to that, then we had the NCD overlays, which was the conservation. Well, some people wanted other things. So all of a sudden, in one small area, we had 22 zoning designations. Clearly, that's why you needed an attorney to be able to get you through the process of the permitting process. This is the map in Coconut Grove. <coughs> this is how many zoning designations you have. Why was that a problem? In addition that it was creating great job opportunities for the uh, land use attorneys, the, 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 problem <laughs> the, the problem was that the predictability wasn't there. If someone who was living, this is a very nice single family home neighborhood, you are coming in and you're doing it, and then all of a sudden the buildings were coming up next to you overnight. The people just flipped. They just thought that government had changed zoning on them and we had not told them. And it was just that they didn't know exactly what was supposed to happen <laughs> next door. The other, <coughs> issue, the other issue we had, and, and this one is one that is extremely telling, and this is, not, this is a true project. Um, the way the zoning had it was, and this was, I'll go back step back, the 25, uh, years ago, Miami 
wanted to create incentives for development. So they relaxed a lot of the rules, encouraged development, and this was one of them. They said, you know, on the what you find on your on the only net lot area, that would be as major municipalities have it, you just calculate your FAR, your what you can build based on your net lot area. Well Miami was trying to be a little more friendly and say, will you be able to go to the set, you know, go into the middle of the street and calculate that as your net lot area? That's where you get the second one. Well, since that was not enough, if you were in front of the water, you could get 90 feet into the water. <laughs> and, and, and like that, you proceed. Then you had, in addition to that, you had bonuses. Bonuses that the PUD, the plan unit development, was something that should never have been on high density. It was meant to be on single in duplexes and low density, um, it was more, it, it was meant for low density residential. Somehow we made it to this one, so now you could get 20% additional FAR. I, and that was just in the asking. The city wasn't getting anything. Um, and finally, the affordable housing, which it was a fixed number, not that much. So by the time the city got enough money to do anything, y you know, the time had passed. So. This is kind of the growth, and like I said, this is a true project. It was built. And the problem is that next to it, and go back to the other slide I showed you, you have single family neighborhoods. What we were trying to do with the uh, form based code, like sure many of you know in this room, it was we wanted to create mixed use activities instead of say segregated uses. We wanted to promote walkability in Miami, that's extremely important to us and we wanted to promote transit. The goals of Miami were conservation and development, which appear to be contradicting, but Miami is friendly on the development side, we like it, um, but we need to conserve the neighborhoods because that's really the livelihood of what we have. We have very, very, very nice um, neighborhoods, so, and they are very, very close to our commercial corridor, so how can they coexist? And that was what probably <laughs> took us five years to make sure that those goals uh, we would be able to respond not only to the development, but it was the right development. There was an analysis done. Miami has many neighborhoods. Miami is made of, uh, it, it, this is not a code that you can just apply uh, as we did, uh, because we have a built city. Um, we had to work, we have a very a Hispanic population, we have a Haitian population, we have an African American population. Um, we all had to go out to the neighborhoods, find out exactly what it is that they wanted, what is it that they needed, um, what are their expectations. We consider, because we're trying to promote transit, what areas where growth was already happening, we were trying to encourage the uh, transit-oriented developments, where was the location where they should be within the neighborhood. Uh, this code also addresses the public realm, which the older code does not. Um, so what kind of streets did we want it? There was a heavy analysis done, and this is just one slide to show, uh, you know, a little bit of what happened. It was key for us to be able to translate how much development capacity someone had in their property versus what we were going to give them now. We were going to change the way the rules were, so we need to be very careful that whatever someone, property owner, felt that they had, they were going to get something equivalent. Uh, we were repackaging the goods, if we, and that's what we would say to them, because now it's a form-based code, but we couldn't, what we needed to respect the rights they had and be able to uh, adjust to the context of the neighborhood. So there was a lot of numbering. There was uh, an analysis on parking, for example. Miami's parking does not count towards the FAR. Uh, in this code, it does. So we needed to include that number as part of it. So that was an exercise, and that was for mostly for um, our friends, the attorneys, who wanted to make sure that um, we were being fair. Uh, so we end up with this, a transect-based zoning. And then we have changed the shift from the regular zoning classifications we had to what we call the transects, the T1 which is conservation, that one we have in Miami. T2 we do not, which is agricultural. T3 becomes single family and duplex. T4, three-story buildings. T5, five-story. T6, it goes from a range from 
8 to 80. So it goes from there's a T68 that might be those corridors that are abutting single family or duplex, and then the T680 that would be uh, downtown Miami. And then the Ds, which are the districts, and I'll go into a little bit because we, we've included, we made some changes in Miami, for example, the T4 was non-existent. We did not have such a category. So we went from a single family duplex to something that could go from nine units per acre to 65 units per acre, and from there to 150 units per acre. The T4 gave us kind of that missing link into the zoning. Then we went and said, okay, how do we, we now have the, f the, the two, the three, the four, the five, the six. Now we're going to have the R, L, and O. And that is again, to give us a graduation of uses. We wanted mixed use with no one desegregated uses, but Miami could not go totally fully mixed use everywhere because there has to be some neighborhoods that are only residential. So um, how do we create that transition? We did that by saying, if you look at the T4 or T5, it's the same for everyone, it's just an example. You have R, L, O. R is restricted, meaning only residential. L is limited. That's, for example, if you have a T4L, that might mean that you have a three-story building and the ground level is retail or, or, or commercial. Um, T5 is the same, T6, it depends where you can have, it's, it's, an, um, it's limited, it's, it's not a full mixed use, the O is the full mixed use. What did that do for us? We had, and I have another map that I'll show you, we were able to place these zoning categories, not only in context with height, but amount of commercial and mixed use as it was coming closer to the neighborhood. If it, there were some neighborhoods that did not want to have high rises, which was the 150 units per acre, but it was a commercial corridor abutting a single family historic neighborhood, well, that might go for a T50, which on the rear it was a T4L, and that way we were able to manipulate and put the pieces responding to the context of how much commercial was the neighborhood willing to absorb. This is the map, um, and that one, it's, it's uh, looks like a quilt, <laughs> but it was able to allow us, if you look, if, and I don't have another map of what it used to be, we, we, we combed the city, the consultants and the planning department staff, we went out and checked every single neighborhood, every single property, and we said what it is that, every, that people want. There's some areas, for example, where the um, purple is, that used to be all industrial. Well, that's really wasn't happening like that. Well, on the light purple, we introduced a new category, which is one that we call the one, which it's work live. It was already happening illegally. People are, it's an area that it's booming. It, there's a lot of businesses going, uh, but the ind industrial <coughs> classification does not allow for residential. So what we did is we created a new category that allows for residential within the industrial for work lift. But it's not a no mixed use. That's just because we want to promote the work lift. That happened in that area, which was uh, in the, uh, it's mostly uh, hard, you know, work, you know, working people, stores, retail, mostly from Hispanic origins. But the same, it also helped us. There's another one that for the artist, also in an area called Wynwood, that if you see on the far right, also help us. So in those things we were able to, because we were able to do the form-based code, because we were able to work with the how much of what can we put in, allowed us to really respond to the context of the neighborhood in the city of Miami. That before, like I said, it was if you had commercial, it was one commercial was for all of them. We, you know, C1 was restricted commercial, 150 units per acre, and that's pretty much it. The form-based code allows us to, to work with the form, responding to the context and the amount of the use. The new categories we have created in the code that we didn't have before, it was the T3L. That's a granny flat. Um, again, only the historic properties in Miami had it in some neighborhoods because they had the papers that went back in the 20s. But clearly there is a need, not only for if more affordable housing, it allows us to provide for that ability to have it, and it also allowed us for in the inner city, people, they're getting older, and it's a way of them to be able to stay in their houses, but rent, and do it illegally. Um, the T3L, we did ask every single neighborhood, do you want it? The neighborhoods were the ones that needed to come through and say yes or no. 
If not, it would remain as just straight single family home. The T4, like I said, that's uh, the transition between the low and the high density. Um, and that one came, it was kind of the missing link in our language and we were able to use it. And that, I that is a great one because it can be mixed use, it can be residential, but it's three stories. And the D1, which is the one that allows for work leave, it's 36 units only residential. Um, and it's, uh, that one was an interesting, we started with 18 units per acre and then the developers who were working with this type of category, they said, you know, in order for us to do it, we need more. So there was a back and forth and, we, you know, we said, we said, okay, we'll do 36. If this needs to change, we'll do it. But at this moment it's 36. But it was people that were trying, that had developed um, in, in New York, in Soho, they had worked on it. And they said, you know, if it's too little, it doesn't work. It has to be a little more than that. So that one is one that it was uh, a lot of discussion with, you know, w we wanted to have less. Uh, and we settled for a little more, hoping that it actually would trigger the type of activities that we're looking for. The development capacity, the way that is calculated, unlike the other image that you saw as the building group, it's easy. So you have a T68, the FAR is five, just multiply it, and that's it. That's what you have. You know, there's no, you don't have to be looking in every single article to find out if there's a little bonus that you're getting here or there. It's pretty much, you just multiply it by your uh, net lot area. I put to a few samples of the four, the five, the regulations are straightforward. If any one of you goes into the Miami21.org, uh, basically say this is at the four. What you have on the left is just the uses. It's easy. You look at the four and say you are at the four L and you, anything that has an R is, re is uh, by right. If it has a W, it's administrative process, but pretty much in one page you can see what uses you can and cannot do. If it's blank, you cannot do it. <laughs> and which in Miami before, I say it lightly, but in Miami before it was up to the administrator to see, well, exactly what it meant. Um, so it was for us was important to say, if it's here, it's here. If it's not, it cannot get done. Um, and then it has the, the, what is on the building placement. Again, it says, what's the lot area? It, the building setback and that that sort of thing and then the images um, below it was just to give people an idea of in scale it's not style it's the scale same would be for t5 and same would be for t68 and the and like you see and the t68 but like i said it goes to 80 but again what it tries to <coughs> convey is it's an easy process, it's in one page. And these are the things we were trying to, <coughs> to avoid on the image on what you have above are existing projects and what is below is the images as to if we were able to say, put the T4s as we did in the zoning maps to create that transition that today does not exist. <coughs> Face of the building, this is, as you see, is existing. Um, things like that were in the code where garages were allowed to be fronting on a major thoroughfare. This is Biscayne Boulevard. This is what we call the signature statement. You know, it's in front of the water, and this is a, a garage. The, the building on the right-hand side, basically that's when we said, you know, you have to have a liner. You have to have habitable space. We didn't say what habitable space. It just had to be habitable space. And also retail. The other building, the one on the white, you know, and, and it was, a, I'm sure, a building that at the time, it was a, a good thing, but there's no retail. There's just, it's hard to see, but it's just kind of grass and a little, you know, I, I call it, you know, paper hole cup. Uh, it, it just, it does, it, there's nothing, it's blank and a garage. This is the same, uh, the liner, the one on, your, on the right, that is actually a project that one day was on the paper, we had not seen it. And it did not have a liner, it had a garage. We, I got a call in the office saying, what is this project you just approved? I said, we haven't approved anything. Um, it, but it was that, you know, it was again sitting down and saying, you cannot do it. The code now will require them that they would have to have a liner. But we end up with a lot of what you see on the, on the left. And people, when we started asking for the liners, they were not, um, at first, there was, might have been some resistance, just but at the end, the people, were, you know, people do it. You ask, and they do it. How to use the code? It's easy. 
contrary to what we had before. Uh, you look at the, at the atlas, you look at what you have, uh, what are you zoned for? Article 3 is general transect zone regulations, that's for everyone. Uh, step three, you go to the uses, which is, this is the whole one page. And, and the other ones that you saw was a little portions of the particulars, but they range <laughs> from the threes to the Ds. So in one page, you can see what are the uses. Four is the Article 5, we tell you the placement. <coughs> and uh, Article 6, there's some uses that might require additional protection, and those are, but it's not all of them. And finally, the the process itself, the permit, what you see on your left-hand side is how we would wish these projects to be, is by right. If you follow the code, there's no public hearing. You just do it. And we had a project um, before I came to the Law Fellowship. Uh, it's a high-rise Banco Santander. In con uh, it's done by the firm of Competers and Fox. High-rise, Brickell Avenue. No public hearing. They just follow the code. And to us, it's, uh, it's a win-win because we get the, the uh, projects with the elements that we are endorsing. And for them, it's a good thing because they follow the code and there's no public hearing process. So they should come in, in and out and get a building permit. And these are things, these are images of what the code is trying to do, the transformation of the blank walls, urban infield redevelopment, turning development outward, our zoning before used to, in an office zoning category, you could not have retail facing the street. It had to be inward. Um, building communities. Neighborhood Main Street. One thing that um, on the one on the right hand side, we are also asking, and I don't have them as part of this slide, so I'll need to point it out. Anything that is at T5 or at T6? we would require 10 feet setback, and that's just to give Miami wider sidewalks. Um, so we're dealing also with the public realm. <coughs> but more than the code, and I like to stress this, it, it Miami 21, we want to say it's a planning document. It has sustainability. Um, anything that is 50,000 square feet or more is required to be silver lead. If the, the, if the person has m does platinum or gold, they get a bonus. Or if someone has something less than 50,000, then will they get a bonus. So we're trying to promote it, but the baseline is 50,000 or more. We have also incorporated in this code landscape and tree protection ordinance, architectural and landscape standards, successional zoning, that's something that was not existent in Miami. In Miami, you could have had a zoning, a property that was zoned single family, and you wanted to change it to high density commercial, residential, like what we call the third commercial. It could be done. Um, and that's what created the anxiety with the neighborhood. Um, what we changed it to say, the only way you can, first, you, if you have, a, say, a T5, you can ask at the six. If you have at the four, you can ask at the five. At a four can never go to a six. There has to be gradual. Um, the larger context, it used to be that someone could come only showing their abutting property and then make a case. Now we're saying the property, the analysis has to be more encompassing. So if you're asking for a five and everything is a four, then the <coughs> answer is going to be no. And uh, only twice a year. Presently, the changes that we were seeing was every month to the comprehensive land use map and the zoning map. Transfer of development rights. Again, Miami did not have transfer of development rights. The transfer of development rights are for historic properties and architecturally significant. And that was important. We saw a lot of demolition in Miami going on. And what we were trying to do is saying the transfer of development rights will only be for the historic properties. They have to go through a review process with the planning department. But basically, they will be able to, all the unused FAR that they cannot do, they can sell. And the selling of it, the city is out of it. The city is not part of it. The, what we only, the, what we give is a certification that in fact they have restored the property so we don't end up just with something derelict. But the financial transaction, the city is out of it. 
public benefits. This is something that we do. Um, again, um, we th this one is going to be something good for the city. Um, it's for affordable housing, workforce housing, parks and open space, green buildings, brown fields. But this is just how it works. There's three options for the public benefits. If you want to get a bonus for, say, on this one is affordable housing, if you do the housing, the affordable housing, in the project that you're building, we will give you twice as much in FAR. If you do it somewhere else, then you get one, on one per one, or you contribute money. The way that the money, how much do you pay for the bonus or for the square footage, it depends what area of the city you're in. It used to be that you only had 1247, and that was true for the inner city, which was true for the central business district. We did an analysis, part of the consultants. We had a, um, an, ec an economic consultant, which, and we looked at the numbers of how much were people being able to sell the square footage. So we felt that it was fair to be able to say, if you're in the inner city, maybe we're talking about $9 or $7, but if you're in Brickell, then you should be paying $22, $25. And the other thing we did, given the economy, when we started this process, the economy had not tanked. So the numbers were higher. But what we were able to do is to say adjust it so that when the economy goes down, the numbers go down and the economy goes up, it would be reviewed yearly. And that was, again, by an independent party, not, not the city. Um, and people were comfortable with that. It was just the first thing. Um, the way the public benefits work, on a T6, as I was describing, the T6, 8, the 12, the 24, the numbers on the left are the height by right. On the right-hand side, there's the 8 to the 12, the 12 to the 20. Those are what you can bonus up to. If you are on a T6, 8, you can go up to 12 stories. That's it, not 13, not 14, just 12. Um, same for the 12, same for the 24. That's where the public benefits come in. So if someone wants to buy that's that's what they that's the range they 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 have to to add for the bonuses, which it was not it wasn't what was happening. So it's adding to the predictability, and the neighbors know what's what is happening. On a particular one on the T six A twelve, if you are aborting a single family, you cannot bonus up. You have to remain, and that was again protection for the neighborhoods. And this civic space. Um, this is again how it works. Uh, we do have, as part of the effort on Miami 21, a parks master plan. So we have, we know the areas of need. So if you are able, what we would like to see, if you build open space in an area of need, you get twice as much as you gave as part of your bonus. Again, the same thing as the housing. If you build an in, in the property, you get the development capacity or you can contribute. The city would rather you build it the same as affordable housing, build it. Um, so that's why we are promoting it and giving the developer twice as much, because that's what we would like to have it. But the, and the other thing on the civic space is important to note for yes, the planners that might be in the audience, we do also have size restrictions. You cannot just give us leftover space and call it a park or call it an open space, or call it a plaza. It has to have a particular size. And they're clearly describing the code what is what. If you don't meet it, you don't do it. Uh, this project that I was referring to, Banco Santander, they did that. They gave us half an acre of a plaza, and it went into their building. <coughs> Finally, a special area plan. We recognize that there are areas where maybe you have more than the, the, that the restriction on the transect for the zoning change <coughs> might be too restrictive. So what we thought, if you have parcels of land of nine acres or more, then you can come and through design guidelines, through a master plan, be able to, you know, kind of come up with this, this transects uh, that might be different so you're not restricted <coughs> to, the, uh, to the one step up. But the only way you can do that it's one is approved by the city council, but it, you have to give us design guidelines, master plan. There has to be civic spaces involved, and there has to be the public realm. So what do we, the city, what does it get? We get all that, the public realm built. Uh, we get amenities built. Um, and there's design guidelines, so there will be restrictions into how the development <coughs> will happen. There, this particular project that I'm showing, it, um, it actually was approved. 
Um, it's a block away from the water. Um, and hopefully one day we'll pick up again and get it done. But that was uh, actually was a, a firm from here, Al Guzman Freddy, who worked on this project. And finally, the public involvement. This one is <laughs> five years and 500 meetings. Um, <laughs> we did everything on the, uh, we went from stakeholder meetings, we went to radio, we went to the paper, we went uh, every way we could reach it to the churches. It, it, it we actually had even, uh, Miami has something called neighborhood enhancement team offices. Um, there's like mini city halls in the neighborhood and we actually had people walking over to the houses and just giving the flyers. We went out to the <coughs> neighborhood, um, probably, in addition to the many public meetings, we went out and showed them what is it that we were doing. They gave us their input. We came back to them, say, okay, this is what we've done. And then people had a chance of seeing where their property was on their map and say, no, I don't like it, I like it. You know, it, it was at that level. And then finally, the third time where it was, okay, this is it. Um, that was the only way of doing it. Um, I don't think we could have done it any other way. Um, it was a change of mindset. But what we found it was that people wanted that change. Um, so it was a matter of being able to communicate in a language that they understood in order to make it happen. Um, so like I said at the beginning, it was five years. It was approved a year ago. Um, I would say the importance of lessons learned. <laughs> um, one, the importance of political leadership um, and public participation. I don't think with either it would have been difficult, I would like to say, then you know, if it would not have been five, it would have been 10. We would not have let it go. But it did, it, the public participation was important. There was a lot of, at times we even had to put the code and red line where the changes had been done and give it out to the public, just so they had seen where the changes were that they in fact had an impact and we were just not, you know, listening to them but not doing anything. And finally. <laughs> So if there's any questions. Well, let, me, uh, let me moderate the questions a little bit and start off with one. And uh, I'm glad you, you mentioned the, the leadership of, uh, of Mayor Manny Diaz. As it reminds me, we did have him here speaking at our journalist conference uh, last spring and heard a little bit from the mayor's yeah. perspective on this. So here's the planner's view. I think a very good presentation of the form-based code as it applies. And I, you know, I know most people don't know about transex and so forth, so I was wondering if we can introduce into this vocabulary the idea of planning spandex, providing this kind of <laughs> vertical elasticity that stretches a bit, but not too much, and very contextual in the sense that it always stretches relative to what's around it. So you've got a kind of uh, a limit on the sort of upward uh, movement. And, and I just say that to describe it, but I have a question, and, and that is, in all of this, which you know, sounds like it's going to increase the capacity of the city to, uh, to develop, that overall it, it probably could do that. And because uh, nothing shrinks as far as I can tell, everything gets a little upward possibility. Is that, is that fair to say? Mm -hmm. Not fair. Not, not so, so this is, uh, let me just frame yeah. the question, I'll let you and answer. Is, is, is there a growth uh, assumption here, uh, <laughs> as in, let's say, New York City, which says we're going to add a million people and our zoning is going to provide the capacity to absorb a million people, so we're going to upzone quite a bit to do that and move things to. Uh, in, in this case, was this neutral too? Was it reducing? Was, you know, what was the sort of the net effect? And I realize because there's flexibility, you don't know exactly, but maybe what's the maximum <laughs> effect that you could get? It was, we had to do the, that exercise because with this change on, this, on the transect, we had to change the land use. Right. Um, so in order for us to be able to change the land use, we needed to get state approval. So that's an, uh, actually uh, that exercise we had to do because we needed to make sure that the levels of capacity were sustainable. Um, so we did an analysis and what happens is that in some areas the uses are increasing, but in other areas, even though the uses, the, the say for example, we're having a, 
a mixed use area now that it used to be residential, but now we're saying that it has to be less height. So in uh, some areas, we're giving you more uses, less height. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in some areas, uh, we are reducing it considerably. So what was it, it was that our, the, the key was to be able to say, we're giving you more uses. It's just the height is the one, so if the building is, the height is restricted, then you're actually having not as much. So the balance was, I, um, I think if I remember correctly, probably was a, uh, on changes on land use that when increasing, we're probably talking at 10% that increased, and those were mostly the industrial areas that where you could not have had residential, that now you had it for the ones that I was delighted, the work lift. Um, but because in other areas, we're actually reducing it, that's where it balanced out. So we had to, um, we had to do that analysis for the state and make sure that the uh, levels of services for the street were still um, functioning. So, so, so the, the net was neutral, the, the no additional growth potential based on this? Well, it wasn't that so much as the growth potential, it's just that what we had where we were, growth will happen and it will continue happening. No, no, but within what, what you had but, before. But what we had before, it was a give and take in some areas. Yeah, yeah. What we had was something where you couldn't even control how much it was and we were able to reduce it. So it was, and how do we reduce it by the size of the building itself? Okay, very interesting. All right, let's open it up. Uh, <coughs> looked like the transfer development right concept for your, your uh, historic preservation uh, is fairly straightforward. Um, let's say you <coughs> following up on this down zoning where you, you can't build as much or you're up zoning. Was there some sort of a, a way to compensate an owner with uh, some sort of a payment uh, like for the a TDR? For, the, tra for the transfer of development rights? Well, I'm saying if you up zone or down zone, somehow mm -hmm. If you lose value, you're going to. Well, the, the, the issue was that I can tell you when we did this study, yeah. it wasn't, it was very few properties that actually had changed. Uh -huh. Because in some areas you had, and I'll give you an example, there's an area in West Brickle, uh, which is um, it's high end, mix, uh, it used to be residential in this particular portion. Um, it, it had office, let me see, remember, it had office there, that, that's it. What we said to them, and the height was unlimited. In Miami, when they say unlimited, it's a way of saying that uh, there's no restriction, but, of, but the building, you know, you cannot do it depending on the size of property you have. But there was always that concept. What we said to them was, well, and this was true for many others, we said, well, maybe before you only had office. Now you can have residential, now you can have retail, now you can have a hotel. So yeah, you know what, you might not have that unlimited perception that you had before, but we're giving you more uses so your building is more marketable. And you know, many times they have to agree. Industrial, the same thing. We had conversations of people saying, oh, industrial, I couldn't, uh, you know, first they're grandfathered in, meaning that it's not that their use will, you know, that they have to next year change, or they have 40 years, but what we're saying is to them, now you have another option. So what it really turned was more of a positive thing because what we were saying to many of the properties, now you have mixed use, now you have that ability. There was another area close to the water, high rise, residential, and they always wanted to have retail. What we, and they couldn't. And what we said, we changed it. We changed it to one of the L's, meaning the height you have to when I say Heidi, you're, we're talking about 50-story buildings that you can bonus up. We're not talking about small ones. But we're saying, but you can have X amount of commercial that you didn't have before. So that's really um, what we found in most of the cases. There were some properties that, that were down, um, and the way the city was able to deal with it, because it is a hard time, as you saw on the first, there were a lot of projects that really came in already, that were already had invested money, and what the city said was, if you have a project that you already have a permit for, you're, you're best, you, know, you have the life expectancy that you would have had if the code would not have changed. And if you had one building and it had another phase, and you couldn't do the phase because the economy just tanked, you're vested for life. So the city in every position tried to allow for the person, the developer, the owner of the property who had invested the money on the permitting to be able to give it fair. So I think for the most case on the big projects, if they had a permit and they had not 
done anything, not, a, not dig a hole, they just had the permit, they have seven years to do that project. What we did, because we wanted to have the Miami 21 code, not the old code, is how do we put the incentive? So the incentive was to say, today, if someone, if say I have a project under the old code, <coughs> I have it on seven years, in five years I want to change it, I have to get to a public hearing. That's the rules today. So they uh, live by the rules of today. But if they have the Miami, they have a project and they want to do something better with Miami 21, it's an administrative process. So they don't go to a public hearing. So that was our way of saying, just follow the code. Again, it's clear what you need to do. So if you do it, it's not a public hearing. And, uh, and so, so that was the way that you know, we tried to incentivize the process while protecting you know, the investment that people have made. But in, I would say to answer in your question more directly, I think we added more uses and what we found is that people found that more beneficial. Right. But you also grandfathered those uh, and we, we rights, so they, they weren't really taken away. Have our people right. a question in the back that we'll work for? Right. Just a quick, well, um, I'm a little bit confused about the, um, when you change uses and you're compensating to some extent, are you uh, compensated on the potential use of the current use? For instance, you have an area where the current use is, say, a FAR of 2, but the, uh, the area had been zoned before that could go up to 4. Now you're reducing to 2 or 3 or something like that. In other areas, you may have reduced the current use or potential use. I, I'm just trying no, to understand. No, there's two, there's two, th yeah. there's two things. Let me see if I can explain it. Yeah. As far as the number, which it goes to the 2 that you're mentioning, we did an analysis and say today you had X amount of FAR that you could build under the old code. When we changed the FAR number, the multiplier, to the code, we took in consideration you need for parking, you need for the elevators, you need for lobby, you need for all that dead space that before it didn't count. And then we err in giving more to make sure and there was an analysis done on all, sing all properties, on the mid block, on the corner, everywhere to just, and probably I would say a lot of them benefited. The ones that I will admit to you that are not, are the ones who face in the water, that before they could go 90 feet into the water. That does not exist. But pretty much that's how we came to the number of how much your FAR and how much. So as far as capacity, you, it's, it's the number, this was a very, um, well, the, word is, uh, the, the work was done in, you know, over and over on the calculations because we needed to make sure that we were not taking any, you know, that we were protecting the rights as much as we could. So that's how the number. Now, the uses. The uses, if you had residential before and you didn't have any other use, we were adding uses that you did not have before. So it was on... W w you know, if you had residential, now we're giving you mixed use. So it went from if you had office, you, we were giving you additional uses that you didn't have before. So, so there's two different things. One, the mathematical calculation on FAR and how much do you have, and then the uses. For the most part, it was in addition to what you have, you can do this much more. And you charge for that? No, we did not. No, well. It, then th that is what you end up with. Now, if you say you have a T6, say, let's go eight, and you want a 12 story, that bonus, that is what you have to pay. But today, people were paying tw for 25% extra FAR. The one which I'll, which is, it is true, you know, the PUD, the plan unit development was free, now they pay, yeah. But they, all, they should have paid because if not, everyone wants parks, everyone wants affordable housing, everyone wants civics, but well, you know, and a developer is coming and there was 20% free FAR that we were giving and they were selling it. So there should be a compensation. So probably that one, and I can tell you on the conversations, that was probably, they didn't fight it as much. There was at the, at the beginning a little bit, but they knew. In Miami, and we will go back to the history, when we had bonuses on the other code, people would say, no one will ever use the bonuses. Everybody uses bonuses. And with this particular project, the one that I make reference in is just because it's a high rise and it's the one that I signed off before I left. 
um, they used every single bonus. They, they used, they, uh, and uh, because that's just the nature. If there is, uh, they will be able to use it. But, but again, we're at the end of the day, everyone's getting a better city. They are, and we are. Do they actually pay for the bonus in cash, or do they do it they have three. They have three options to do it. Um, in this, they had three options. We would rather, if they go for affordable housing, we would rather they build, the, uh, they, if they do that, the incentive the city's given them is that you're getting two, s two for one. We cannot force them. They have to, if not, they do it somewhere. So how can the city do it? It's like the, part, the open space in an area of need. Well, in Little Havana, Little Haiti. Well, we would rather someone build it there, so we cannot force you, but we can give you money, meaning you can get twice as much and you don't have to pay. So the payment was really the third alternative. We would rather people build it. It's more efficient and, uh, and you know, it's better. But the option exists that if they don't want to do it, they can contribute to the fund. Okay. Uh, right here, sir. Um, first of all, congratulations for Thank accomplishing you. this. Not too many cities have accomplished such a comprehensive change like this. Um, I have a question about the economic cycles. Uh, this was obviously put together during boom times. And I assume, and I think you've said a lot of your calculations were based on mm -hmm. what owners and developers said would work financially. We're in a different time now. What are you finding today in terms of owners who uh, do want to build, if they can afford it these days, are they finding the new code works for them now? Or are they coming to you for relief because of changing finances these days? What I understand, the code has been in place for a year. Mm -hmm. uh, the development we have seen is actually helping because I think what people were, um, what they're finding is that they're doing a building that might not be as huge, but now because we were able to add more uses, they're probably getting a better product, even though they might not have the height, but they're not doing the height anymore. Eventually they will do the height. So what on the projects that I know, I'm talking to the people back in the department are coming, and the feedback we get is, for one, the architects are happier. <laughs> Uh, because now they're in control, you know, it's not the attorneys, but it's actually, I hope there's not <laughs> yeah. land use attorneys, are, but it, it was important. Uh, but we're finding that the, the things that we're asking are not that, you know, because we're giving them more use. We also did another thing, and I didn't talk about it, which maybe goes to your question more precisely. Um, because it's a form-based code, it has some limitations. Say, if you have a, lot, a block that is 340 feet, you need to have a pedestrian pass through. You know, those are normal things that cities have without you thinking about it. Well, we didn't know, and I'm just giving you an example when you said about someone getting a little bit relaxed. Well, there may be a project, and in zoning we cannot be as specific to say 300. You know, if we say 340, it has to be 340, it cannot be 341. So what we added was the last of the waivers is one that relieves you 10% of whatever law. And we found that to be very useful and people like that. Because sometimes it might not be that one, it might not be that two feet, but we need some flexibility without saying, throwing the code out the window. So, so, so spandex, I never saw it that way, but yeah, spandex. <laughs> so that gives us, so, so those are the things and, and, um, that we're finding. Uh, that in the waivers we were able to kind of, because we knew. The other thing we've done in this code is to be able to say, in a year, we will go out again to the neighborhoods and review it. The, is it working? Mm -hmm. you know, and because there are areas which will grow, and right now might be at this 624, but might be ready for at this 636. And government should do this comprehensively, not again like so it happens you know, in 25 years, we're looking back and it's again a piecemeal effort. And that's part, I'm sorry, part of the code is for us, for the planning department to go out again to the community and do this. In some cities, um, the uh, zoning plan exists on several levels. I know one city has a zoning plan below grade, another zoning plan on grade for pedestrians, and a third zoning plan at the upper level where you have views for apartments or for offices. And that gives more continuity of streetscape. Uh, do you think something like that would be in addition or would that be in contrast to the form-based zoning? I am not as familiar with the ones you're saying. I know that on the form-based code, which we didn't have before, 
the public realm is part of it. So there's an article on the code that talks about what kind of treatment you get depending on what transect you're in. So if it's at, you're at T4, you have a